So they know I'm new. Yes, they know you're new. They're gonna just just, just sniff your head. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yeah. Oh, it's such a soft warm. They, they like to be patted on their necks. They're not too okay. fond of their faces being pet. Um, I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah. very very curious. I'm gonna steam up the lens there, Pietro. This is the grandfather <laughs> to Pietro. That's Jeff. And uh, oh, I Jeff. Got nipped. Jeff is the, the father of Nisha. And uh, this male here is, is totally unrelated. And uh, when he's mature in another year or so, uh, hopefully he and uh, Nisha will breed. So they're, uh, most of them were born right here at the zoo, either here or Frank or Stone Zoo. Pedro. Yeah, good boy, huh? Hey, no nipping. No. Good boy. I guess people shouldn't stick their fingers in. Yeah, hey, whoa. Pedro, whoa. <laughs> no, no. Good evening and welcome to Dead Air Live. I'm Elizabeth Altman and I'm the host of tonight's show. Yes, there is a zoo in Boston. My guests tonight are from the zoo. They are Paula Silver, who is the um, senior outreach educator at, uh, for the Zoomobile at the Franklin Park Zoo and Maya Apfelbaum, whose title is Zoom Into Animals Educator. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, a lot of people don't maybe realize that because the name of the zoo is Franklin Park Zoo, they don't think of it as Boston's public zoo. Um, it's the zoo that people in Boston, you know, who are visiting from out of town and people who live here um, can go to. And it's only about, what, 15 minutes from downtown Boston? That's it. And available. Um, via public transportation, yes? That's right. We can talk about that a little later. Um, well, we have some interesting things. We're got new changes at the zoo, lots of changes, both um, administrative or managerial, and also just exciting new happenings because mm -hmm. life is going, and, um, going on, and there will be new life in the spring. So um, we have some, um, a tape that we'd like to show you. Um, is our tape ready? When I started, um, as with um, if a lot of people are familiar with this, that the zoos were both Stone Zoo and Franklin Park. Um, we're one zoo with two locations. We were uh, managed by the uh, the Metropolitan District Commission, which is a state agency. And uh, as a lot of people know, the zoos fell in disrepair, and uh, there were questions as to, you know, the uh, the proper amount of budget money allocated to the zoos and. Uh, we just weren't getting the attention that we really needed. Um, There's also some bad press about the location of the zoo, and we were just not getting the visitors nor the, the funding. Um, whereas now we've been, uh, we've got a new corporation that's managing the zoos, the uh, Commonwealth Zoological Corporation, and it's a privately funded program um, or agency. And now we can actively solicit funding, and we're looking for corporate sponsorship, and people can make donations to the zoo now. So the, the change that I've seen, they've, they've been incredible. And a lot of times uh, now what zoos are doing is they're, they're a lot more conservation minded than they were years ago. And whereas zoos are not so much just a form of entertainment, they're also a form of uh, education and conservation. So what we're trying to do is get animals that are endangered in the wild and uh, breed them here in captivity. For Adax antelope, uh, we've done very well with breeding that species. And because they're actually more in captivity than there are in the wild, this gives you know people an opportunity to see these guys. I have an idea. I think um, they might have gone into the duct work here. They've been they they've been seen bringing some straw and things into the up into the bed of the lights. Blue crown motmot. The motmots actually have nested in here. They make a burrow. They dig a burrow, and uh, they raise the young in the in the burrow. And in one day, you'll find two or three extra, and uh, they come out. It's it's very interesting. They have also have a. I'm surprised he hasn't come down. They usually come right down for the crickets and mealworms. But uh, he's up here in the tree. They have an interesting tail. It's like a, got a racket on the end of it. And it actually grows in like a regular feather. It's a full, uh, a full feather when it grows in. And as they preen, 
parts of it break off. So you'll have a feather, then a bare area, and then a then the racket or the other part of the feather. And it's they, they use that uh, when they're excited or if they're afraid or something. The tail will go. It's like a pendulum. It'll kind of a tick tock back and forth. We do have a number of behavioral research programs going on. One, um, maybe you can see it now. The sun bittern uh, is on a nest on eggs. We have a keeper that is uh, that will be studying the chick and the parents as they feed the chick um, to f how long they uh, how long they feed the chick, what the chicks behavior is, displays uh, uh, the young make and which parent feeds more, things like that. Bali Minas, uh, they're now at Stone Zoo. They were transferred up to Stone Zoo. We will be getting some in here. Part of a, a, an SSP program, a species survival plan, where the birds are matched up in terms of genetics. They, you basically match up the birds to keep the, the genetics the purest. You don't want to inbreed. You don't want to have uh, siblings mating or, or reproducing. We've actually hatched three up at Stone Zoo, three of the Bali Mina chicks. They're going to be sent to other parts of the zoo or other zoos, and we will get some birds from other zoos to come in and, and we'll pair them up. So we'll have a pair at Stone Zoo and also a pair here in the rainforest. Hi. Hello. Well, um, that was pretty interesting. It looks like there are a lot of changes going on at the zoo, and one of them um, was mentioned by Lisa Hayes Shea, who was the early pers earlier person in the tape, who mentioned about the change, um, the a little bit about the history, changing from the MDC managing the zoo, the Franklin Park Zoo, and the Stone Zoo, and now being managed by the Commonwealth um, Zoological Corporation. Could you, um, maybe Maya, maybe you could, or, or Paula, either one of you could talk about uh, the history of um, the Zoo, Franklin Park Zoo and a little bit about that change that's been mm -hmm. happening. It's a very exciting change. I've been there longer, so I guess I'll talk about it mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, as you might know, the Franklin Park Zoo uh, and Stone Zoo um, were run by the Metropolitan District Commission, so we were basically a state run agency. And um, two years ago the Commonwealth Zoological Corporation took over. Um, so we're now a private um, run uh, corporation, which means, as Lisa mentioned on the tape, that we can now accept and solicit uh, funding from private corporations, uh, local, opera local uh, operations uh, and donations, and from private individuals as well. And that will really help because it's only the zoos with lots of corporate funding that can become world-class zoos, and that's what we're looking for now. Well, that's interesting. I, I wasn't really aware that the um, most famous zoos were corporate, funded by corporate, um, corporate funds. Well, that's where the, the big money is. So that's so. what we're, we're trying. We have a brand new um, uh, chief executive officer and president of the zoo, Sanders Llewellyn, who uh, has a long history of um, being able to fundraise at various zoos in the country, the Atlanta Zoo um, in particular. And um, he's now head of our zoo and is trying to fundraise so that we can get the, the funding that we need to bring in the kinds of exhibits that we would like to have at the zoo. Was that not possible before when it was run by the MDC? Was it hot, hard to get money for big exhibits? Well, the only money that was available was through the state. And uh, as you know, state funds have been limited for quite a while now. Um, the um, African Tropical Forest was 17 years in the making because of funding problems, uh, and that finally came to fruition in 1989. So we're hoping it's not going to take 17 years. Uh, as a matter of fact, we, we're uh, planning uh, within the next two years a predator prey exhibit at Franklin Park Zoo, which go is going to feature a pride of lions as well as some prey animals um, in different locations, of course, um, which will be really exciting. and. Um, Right now, we've got a brand new arthropod exhibit, um, which fe features mostly insects up at the uh, Birds World. So that's a new, a new exhibit that we have as well. Wow! So, so there's a lot of changes, <laughs> things exciting going things going on. Yes. That's very exciting. Um, I, let me just ask you. You said that um, 
now that money is becoming available and you can solicit funds, mm -hmm. um, what, are we going to see more commercial enterprise at the zoo? Are we going to walk in and see lots of souvenirs or is it going to still look like the, um, the zoo that we knew? Is it going to look different to No, us? it's going to look quite different. <coughs> um, one of the plans is to have a gift shop. Mm -hmm. um, which will have all kinds of souvenirs from t-shirts to stuffed animals. Um, we plan at some point to also have a restaurant there. Right now we do have a concession stand, but we want to expand on that too. And uh, everything costs money, and so that's what we're hoping to raise. As you're able to raise the mo raising money and, and um, through private donations and corporate donations, is that, is that good for um, zoo visitors and zoo animals and the zoo's um, employees and um, management of the zoo? Is that good for everybody? Raising money, no matter what way, um, as long as it's a legitimate way, is excellent for the zoo because without the kind of money that, um, it, right now we get approximately $3 million, $2.9 million a year from the state still. And that amount will decrease and hopefully in, at by the end of five years, we'll be self-supporting. That three million um, barely helps us to stay afloat. It costs a tremendous amount of money to keep a zoo going, and uh, just to maintain it, let alone putting in new exhibits and uh, bringing in new animals. So it's really important that, um, and pu private donations help too. Uh, anything that schools want to give or children want to give as a class or families want to give is always gratefully appreciated. We also have family memberships available um, through the Commonwealth Zoological Corporation, Corporation and if you become a member there are all kinds of benefits that you can you can get and it's only $35 a year. Oh, that's not too bad. Okay, well that's good. Oh, well, I'm uh, fascinated to hear all these about these changes. It, it looks like it's um going to be good for everybody. It, does, you were, it seemed like you were um, intimating that these kinds of this change is going to make it possible for Franklin Park Zoo to become a world-class zoo. Is that part of the vision of the staff right now? Absolutely. Maybe yeah, Maya can talk maybe. a little bit about that. There's a sense of excitement and rebirth at the zoo because there are um, some of the best of the old crew of people have stayed on and there's also a lot of new life and the two the people who have been there longer and the new people are really allowing themselves to dream and to work hard towards a new level of making the zoo, one, cover issues that are very prominent right now in the environmental and education fields, and also really work with the community, both the local community like Dorchester or Hyde Park, and also with the greater Boston community, and even out into New England to um, both with the commercial companies and with the public to really lift the zoo and then sustain it as, as you mentioned, as a world-class zoo if possible. It's going to take a while to work up. There's a lot of uh, both working on the exhibits themselves and also working on our image with the public because the Dorchester area, as you know, has very poor reputation in the press. And it's one of the things we're working very hard on is to start enabling people to see that coming to the zoo is not such a bad thing or a dangerous thing, but often very, very easy and safe and is something we could talk about a little bit more I'd later. love to talk about Absolutely. it. We can talk about it right now, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of interested myself because I heard Lisa mention how uh, the zoo had received bad press, and I guess bad press and, not, and also lack of funding when it was un managed under MDC equals low visitors. Low visitors obviously means the zoo is not very healthy, and so obviously visitors are, are seem to be part of the zoo's health. You need people to come in order to make it a world-class zoo, and people won't come if they're afraid or they have mm -hmm. um, all sorts of um, unfounded but fearful notions of what the zoo might be like. So why don't you tell us a little bit perhaps about, you know, how, how is, is it really scary to get there? Is it a really terrible place? <laughs> I mean, is it unsafe for people? Can you bring families? Do people with children and o older people come to the zoo? Uh, I'll handle that one. Um, I've been there for five years and I don't go anywhere where it's not safe. Um, we've never had a problem in the five years that I've been at the zoo. Um, I think that unfortunately when things happen in Franklin Park, um, mm -hmm. 
the, the press tends to build that up and people automatically think Franklin Park Zoo when they hear Franklin Park, but Franklin mm -hmm. Park has a huge area of Dorchester. Our zoo is uh, a small portion of that and uh, it's extremely safe. There is an indoor parking lot um, where people can park very close to our Afri new African tropical forest um, that's patrolled. We have the state police there. Mm -hmm. um, it's never been a problem. We have school bus tours come just about every single day to the zoo and um, none of them have ever had a problem. I think it's basically um, people are afraid of what they hear, not of what reality uh, tells us. And so they need to come to the zoo and give it a chance. Once you're there, you're hooked because it's an absolutely beautiful, exciting place to be. So do you think the, the surrounding areas will speak for themselves? Good. Well, I'm looking forward to, I think on the way, uh, um, as we're, the show is winding down, on the way out, we'll see some footage of the grounds perhaps. Mm -hmm. All right. And I understand you haven't been at the zoo, so we're inviting you to come okay. and uh, come and see what it's like. We'll, we'll give you a tour. Terrific. I'd really like that. Um, okay. Well, let's see. We've talked about um, some of the changes um, any, and also in the, bur in the Birds World segment, um, Ed O'Brien was talking about some of the changes in Birds World and the way they were exhibiting. Um, any, do you want to talk about that at all? Well, natural exhibitry is, is um, the zoo of the present and the zoo of the future. You know, in the past, zoos were basically menageries, and a menagerie is just a collection of animals, um, animals that were warehoused or housed in the typical um, concrete bottom metal uh, barred cages and there was no particular um, way of exhibiting animals in their natural habitats or the natural groups. People didn't even consider that. The zoo of the present and especially I'd say our African tropical forest um, at Franklin Park Zoo tries to exhibit animals as, in as close to their own natural habitat as possible. Um, animals, as a matter of fact, um, all of the animals at, in the African tropical forest are from a particular area of West Africa. And uh, someone had recently watched a documentary on Western Africa and every animal that is in our African tropical forest at the zoo was mentioned in this documentary and was shown as living very close together. Mm -hmm. And so we were very excited about that because it means that we are um, obviously doing the right thing when it comes to exhibiting animals and choosing the kinds of animals that we have in the zoo. But you want to make an animal as comfortable as possible because only then will it behave in a natural way. If you put an animal behind bars, you're going to get an animal behind bars that perhaps will become neurotic and won't act the way an animal does in the wild. I think that's a really important point because I think, yes, I'm sure you're aware there are people who don't like to go to zoos. They think it's really un un cruel to the animals and they really mm -hmm. feel that it's unnatural. And, um, and I think one of the things, there was a big cover story in the New York Times a while back about how the, um, uh, was it the Central Park Zoo? Or was it the Bronx, was the Bronx and Central, and Central Park Central Zoo Park. were both changing their names, dropping the word zoo, and they were mm -hmm. becoming conservation uh, parks. wilderness mm -hmm. parks or mm -hmm. whatever. Wildlife conservation. Yeah, parks. and so I guess what it seems like everybody's getting in on this, you know, ecological um, movement. And I'm wondering, is this just trendiness, or is there a real um, un philosophical underpinning to this movement um, to kind of move away from this menagerie approach? Uh, it's definitely more than a trend. Um, it's something that a lot of people internationally have become more aware of, not just zoos. The whole attitude is changing towards our environmental resources, including animals, as holders of different gene pools, mm. um, and also the places that they live in, the habitats, as places valuable in terms of medical um, possibilities and in terms of the greenhouse effect, et cetera, et cetera, that we need to preserve some of these natural environments. So the zoos really are um, in a unique position to take a role in helping to conserve animal species that are very near the brink of extinction in the wild, and then even in the best cases to try to bring animals back out into places where the wild, uh, a wild space, a natural space has been preserved. So um, that's one angle on how the zoos are in this for the long run. You can't be doing this kind of breeding program that we're now working on, which is linked up through computers internationally, the SSP, 
which could stands you, for could we ask just one thing I just want yeah. to mention I want to go over it and the SSP Ed O'Brien mentioned that in the uh, earlier tape we just showed could you explain a little bit more you are explaining it but just so yeah we can it focus stands on what for that is. species oh, can't say that right species survival plan and it has to do with keeping track of different animals like genetical makeup their upbringing who their mother was their father all throughout the world in, in the better zoos or in um, zoos that have access to more technology. And then when zoos want to breed an animal to help keep the gene pool diverse and therefore try to help keep that wildlife stock going, they can access these books called stud books. And you can add in anything yeah. you want. I was just so. going to add something about, for example, we have uh, a Good group point. of zebras at the zoo called Grevy zebras. They are endangered species in the wild. and. Um, they are usually bred only with SSP approval on a yearly basis. We have to get approval from the SSP, which is run by the American Association of Zoos, Parks, and Aquariums. It's the accrediting agency for all zoos uh, in the United States. So that um, once these animals breed uh, and we get offspring the following season, some of the animals from this particular group will go to another zoo to perhaps at some point mate with animals from yet an another genetic pool. And that way it keeps the species diverse and you don't have to worry about inbreeding. You wouldn't have this problem in the wild because if these animals could be in the wild, they would not mate, they would wander off and mate with strangers, not with their close family ties. So that's what keeps the gene pool diverse. Um, we know that there are a lot of people who feel that no animal should ever be kept in zoos. Um, and we believe idealistically that, you know, it's a wonderful ideal to have. However, zoos are probably the last hope for a lot of endangered species. Uh, until we can find a way to put the animals back into the wild, we have to depend on um, the research that, that zoos do, um, and research is a very big part of the new zoo, to uh, provide for um, increased births, say, um, or a better way of, of um, having more animals born so that eventually perhaps we can put some of these animals back into the wild if there is space. But the way the habitats are shrinking now, it's doubtful that there will be space and, and at least we can keep these animals from entering an extinct phase. At least we can keep some of them alive. Just one more point about that. I think as we've gotten, as civilization is further and further away from people being able to have direct contact with wildlife as they're growing up on farms or in the woods, um, that's also helped contribute to the shift where there's less of a feeling maybe of entertainment and more a really important, somewhat weighty feeling to letting these kids see these animals that they may never be able to see anywhere else, mm. even local species now that are hard for kids to see, inner city kids. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the zoos and the whole society around together are moving in a new direction about what the purpose is and the meaning. And yet at the same time there's still a sense of fun in the education. We try to make the programs very alive and have them very active and when they're with kids and have songs and music as well as hardcore facts. And there's usually also a conservation slant when we do education programs or in a lot of the signage, lots mm -hmm. of the explanations at the zoo. So it, it's all coming together. Great. Well, I'm really pleased to be able to have um, brought you in to talk about this. We're going to be looking at a tape soon that is going to be talking about habitats for animals, and you've already been talking about the both of you, and the importance of um, not only the role that zoos are playing in preserving species, but also in, in bringing the animals in contact with humans so that humans can see them and value them. Um, we talk about the habitats in the next tape. Before we go to that tape, I'm kind of interested in uh, whether um, people have been asking this question. The same people who want to, you know, say, "Oh, animals are so unhappy in the zoo," and they keep saying, "Gee, you know, now they've got those those more uh, ecologically correct or um, little ecosystems that mm -hmm. they're creating now. Um, are the animals any happier?" <laughs> Happiness is a relative <laughs> term. We have we, people ask us that question every time. I must get asked it at least three or four times a week. Are these animals happy? Um, happiness is a human term. Uh, the best you could pop probably say is that if you provide 
the right kind of um, habitat for an animal in a zoo, the right kind of, of enclosure, um, that it can at least be content in its own environment. Um, one of the things to look at perhaps is reproduction, is the animal reproducing. Um, animals that are often very stressed will not be able to reproduce, and um, Franklin Park Zoo has a good history of um, reproduction, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later, I guess. Okay, terrific. Well, I think we should just uh, take a look at our next tape. What do you say? Really, the way, if you look in all the exhibits, all of the plants are natural, um, and it, it's basically a, a the idea is like an ecosystem. All the animals are related. Uh, there's, there is competition. Uh, a lot of the animals eat the same. A lot of the birds will eat the same food, uh, fish and things, but they're, they eat different sizes of fish. Or one will you know, swallow a, a fish whole, whereas the other one will tear it apart, and other, other ones will come along, and smaller birds will come along and, and pick off little pieces of that. Uh, it, it, it's. Uh, basically to, to just for an appreciation you get to see the animals in a you know natural environment with uh, real plants and uh, things like that they're not just in uh, stall cages or sterile environments uh, these are some of the insects that we feed basically two types mealworms which are uh, just larvae beetles and uh, the birds love these. I'll throw some in the desert here. And then crickets. Yeah, this is a blacksmith plover. He's not shy. Usually he uh, makes a call, his characteristic call, where he gets his name. It uh, sounds like a blacksmith hitting an anvil, supposedly. Uh, also, you, you'll notice the big nest here in the desert. This was made by the uh, white-headed buffalo weavers. There's a bird right here, uh, the type. They're African birds, and uh, so named because of their nests. They take thorn bushes, and they prefer thorn bushes, and uh, weave the, you know, use the uh, thorns to make nests. They don't mind people watching them. You can take pictures. It doesn't usually bother the birds at all. Uh, they will, again, they are afraid of people. If you get too close, uh, they'll take off. They'll fly away. We do have some that come out of the exhibit and pick around on the ground when nobody's around. Or sometimes when people are here, they'll, if, they're, if they really want something out there, we have a some superb starlings in the swamp that uh, make nests everywhere and they've even nested in the ductwork up here which uh, we have to clean out because it's a fire hazard. Uh, here in the swamp you'll see a lot of very similar forms. Birds with long long beaks, long pointy beaks, uh, long legs, big feet. They're all adaptations for uh, probing into soil or uh, walking through uh, water. Uh, you can see some of the ibis, uh, an ibis over here with longer legs, uh, long legs walking in the water. They probe the water, pick up insects, invertebrates, and uh, the, uh, we have a scarlet ibis in the back here with a long curved beak that's uh, made for probing into the soil. Again, the longer legs will uh, allow him to walk around in the water without soil, without getting his uh, feathers too, too wet. Um, a blackwing stilt in the back with uh, very long, thin legs. The uh, hammer cop, again, another uh, bird with legs adapted to walking in the water. Oh, that brown one. That's this one, yeah, this is a hammer cop, uh, African bird. They're not from one just just one part of the world. It's uh, more habitat, so, which is the name. We walk into the swamp and there are uh, wetland birds. Uh, wetland areas, they, 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 could, they can be dry, they can dry out. 
but as long as that habitat is still there in, during a flood, they act as basically a sponge. They'll soak up a lot of the water. So they're valuable that way. They're also valuable for, uh, for the birds as habitats. There are a lot of nesting areas. Swamps are very productive. A lot of insects um, grow there, which is why a lot of birds nest there, because there's, it's so productive. People tend to run right through this. This is actually the exhibit, uh, except for the flight cage, this is the exhibit with the most number of birds and the most number of species. And it's, uh, people tend to run right through. It's the first exhibit. They, uh, it's the, they, they're put off by the smell a little bit and they just keep going. Uh, it, it's this, if you sit in here and spend 15 minutes quietly watching, you'd see more, uh, more birds than you would ever see if you just came in and looked for a minute and then left. Uh, you see so many different behaviors. We have nesting birds in here. Um, there's a little competition. You'll see things take food away from others, a lot of squabbling, uh, um, and a lot of displays. Right. Uh, this has a, a waterfall here, which does recirculate. It uh, goes down to a lower pool down below and recirculates back up, so we're not wasting any water there. In here, uh, we'll, we have uh, the rainforest species, the uh, pied imperial fruit pigeons, impressive big, big uh, white birds. Um, the rainbow lorikeet, which has an interesting adaptation of a, a brushy uh, tongue. They feed on the wild, they feed on nectar. They're Australian, um, and they feed on nectar in the wild, so their tongue is modified as a, like a brush to lap up the nectar. And, uh, we have purple gallinules, which are, could be found in southern United States and uh, down into Central America. It's always good to look down on the ground in uh, all the exhibits. A lot of people either forget to look up in the trees or down on the ground. And here is one where it's kind of a two-level exhibit. The, uh, well, down here now, you can see there's a purple gallinule down on the ground. He's just about ready to fly up, I think. But if you just look over the edge, you can see. There's also a shallow Turaco uh, down by the pool there. The green bird with the crest. So you basically, have to look ar look all around. Uh, this, uh, a lot of people think that the zoo is closed in the winter. Uh, it's not. We have we were just in the indoor exhibits, and uh, there are, although, just for safety reasons, we don't have the flight cage open because we can't clean it well and with ice and snow and all, uh, it's, it would be hard to clean adequately. But uh, you can see there are birds still out in the flight cage, in the outdoor cage. Uh, we have a screech owl in the, the pagoda exhibit over here. We have the duck pond with a number of species of uh, geese and uh, swans. Do these birds attract other birds from the wild? They do. We have a number of raptors that that are attracted here. We have great uh, red-tailed hawk, uh, Cooper's hawk, sharp-shinned hawk. Um, well, these are predators. Right. <laughs> How about right. That? Also, well, we have sparrows that go in and feed on the uh, the grain and things. How do the birds handle the cold? People. They. Uh, they do very well. A lot of them, well, the ones that are outside now are basically adapted. They can, they can handle the cold. Um, they, uh, they fluff their feathers up, which traps more air. People wear down, down coats, and birds have down. And, I mean, that's a natural, that's their insulation. Uh, they also stay in the water a lot. The water is warmer than the air, and they have special, their legs, a lot of the gulls or the, uh, pheasants and things, they have special uh, circulation where their legs can get very cold, almost down to freezing, but not freeze, uh, just above freezing, whereas their body will stay warm. I'm always amazed. You come in on a bitter cold day and everything's in the water and you just think, well, that's the last place I'd want to be, but uh, it's, uh, it's warmer 
out here uh, we have about maybe 60 different types of birds right now. It increases in the summer. We'll have parrots and uh, um, some of the birds that are on the inside exhibit, we bring them outside. And we provide shelters um, for the wind? for the uh, yeah for the wind, and we've, we'll throw bedding down to help so they don't have to sit right on the cold ground. But a lot of times they don't even use that. They just you know, they maybe they they would feel cornered or something. But today is a pretty cold day. There, I see a number of them over in the hay. <laughs> In most of the exhibits, we feed what's called an omnivore diet, a little bit of everything, uh, meat, fish, uh, fruit, grain, soaked dog chow, soaked monkey chow, which is like a dog's protein and monkey is more of a vegetable uh, chow. And so they basically they choose what they eat. Uh, I've been very lucky, actually. I haven't been bitten. Actually, the, the our rule here is to is to not be is to not we, we try not to uh, take too much control or take much control of the animals. If uh, you know if something is laying an egg, we currently we have a bird in the swamp here on a nest, uh, a sun bittern, that, where it'll raise its chick right here. Uh, we we don't interfere as much as we stay away as much as we can. Allow them to raise their own. And uh, not to interfere. So the uh, we try not to handle. We don't handle anything unless we have to. If it's injured or if it needs care of some kind, then we'll uh, we'll catch it up. So a lot of people have different ideas of view of zoos. Uh, they, you know, people think, oh, they're just different animals. That they're like pets. You know, that we feed them and handle them, and they love to see people. You'll notice that all of the exhibits in in these in the indoor uh, building here don't have any glass or any wires or anything to keep the birds out. They stay in their exhibit naturally. They're afraid of people. They're not pets. They're would rather stay in the exhibit. They're more comfortable and they're natural with the plants and areas to hide than uh, out here in the public area. In this building, this um, has been around for about 20 years. They renovated it. Uh, it was part of the original zoo. The outdoor, uh, the outside shell is about the same, the pagoda style, uh, part of the zoo that was built in the early 1900s. In the early, uh, mid 70s early to mid 70s the building was renovated and the naturalized exhibits were put in and if you think about it uh, 20 years ago over 20 years ago this area looked like this and that was kind of on the cutting edge and people don't think about that they they think oh you know most a lot of people aren't sure there's a zoo in Boston and yet we have had this these naturalized exhibits here for 20 years and it's uh, they're surprised to see them here now, but you know, 20 years ago they were here. Hi, we're back. It was really interesting looking at those birds, and Ed made a comment about how people need to kind of slow down and watch, sit and watch quietly if they want to observe things. I think sometimes, I, I remember reading an article, one of the people was saying, um, the writer was saying how um, people are, even nature lovers who watch uh, na natural programs on TV, are so used to seeing the highlights in nature that they don't have the patience to watch mm -hmm. nature unfold at its normal pace any longer. But you have to be kind of quiet and still in order to really observe. And we're very lucky because we have some additional guests tonight and we're going to be able to observe them. And maybe um, you can tell us what you've brought, but I know that we need to be perhaps a little quiet if we really want to get the full effect. That's Paula? Right. Yes, I'll be glad to introduce our first guests here. Um, these are insects, special kind of insects all the way from Africa, actually from a little island off the coast of Africa called Madagascar. And uh, they are Madagascar hissing cockroaches. I'm going to take one out. And if we're real quiet, I'll try to hold it close to my mic, you might get to hear it hiss. Although these lights might have warmed it up enough, I don't know. Can you hear that? 
I recently did a radio show and I was accused of making the sound myself that it wasn't really the cockroach doing it. That's a defense um, that these animals use to um, protect themselves from their predators. I don't know what that is, but we'll just ignore that. That's why we bring paper towel. Um, when you're this small, um, and you don't have much to defend yourself with, a hissing sound can sometimes be enough to startle a predator, uh, such as perhaps a bird or a snake or another larger insect. And um, this, like all other insects, has six legs. It has three body parts, a head, thorax, and abdomen, and two antennae in the front. This particular kind of cockroach is uh, wingless, and uh, basically its job in the wild is to live on the floor of the tropical forest and um, eat anything that is decaying or dead. So I like to say that without animals like the Madagascar hissing cockroach, we would be up to our eyeballs in garbage. And that helps people to think a little bit differently about insects. Um, what I think is important, most important to us in the education department and what we're trying to get across to people is that, uh, is the interdependence of all living things and the interconnectedness that even though we humans think we're the most important animals on earth, um, we are all equally important and one group of animals without another group is eventually doomed because everything is connected in that big web of life that we talk about. Uh, this is a female Madagascar hissing cockroach and you can tell that because she has a rather flat head with no horns and to show you the difference, this is a younger male, he's not quite as big, she's a full grown female. I'll take out the male. Mm -hmm. And you can <laughs> you can compare my goodness there. No, that's fine. Um, you can actually see that he's got little horns on the top of his head that are still growing because he's not full grown. But the males actually use these in combat. Um, they knock each other over with them. They fight over territory. They fight over females. Um, they fight over just about anything. I won't comment about males in general, but that's what these insects do. And um, as you can see, he's, he's fairly active here. Paula, you have some other um, insects, our, our um, arthropods you brought with you, and yes, I'd love you to do. show them, but we're pretty fortunate to have them t today. What about um, people out in the public or in the schools who perhaps would like to learn more about these um, insects or other animals at the zoo? Well, we have a wonderful program um, called the Zoomobile, and um, we go out on our big truck called the Zoomobile, and we go to schools, we go to uh, nursing homes, we go to hospitals, we go to special town days, and all kinds of special events, and bring uh, a group of animals and do various programs so that people can learn. People who normally can't get a chance to go to the zoo can still learn about animals. It's most popular at nursing homes. Terrific. The residents seem to really like it. And you'll be able to tell us a little bit more uh, if people want to get in touch later on. We'll Absolutely. flash some numbers mm -hmm. on the screen mm -hmm. later on. How about what else do we have there? And, and maybe you could talk a little bit more about education outreach as well. Palmer. Well, Take what I'm going to bring out next has a similar function to the cockroaches in the sense that it also feeds on dead or decaying matter and helps to clean up the forest floor. Also helps to go through the ground, as you can see. I'm pulling it out of some soil. And by doing that, it aerates the ground, which makes it easier for trees to, to root in the ground. And that helps, of course, to keep the whole living system alive. Uh, we have a coworker who really likes to talk about our programs as programs that help people bond to the living earth and its creatures. And that's really what a lot of our programs are about. I take this giant African millipede who has, as you can see, numerous, numerous little feet um, out to schools. I go out usually four times a week uh, when there aren't all these snowstorms. <laughs> and I take um, the millipede and sometimes the cockroaches, sometimes the walking sticks, which I'll show you in a minute, to children between the ages of five and 11. And they're all presently children in the Boston Public School System mm -hmm. who uh, get this program through a grant from the state that's administered through the school system. It's called Chapter 636. Anyway, Does it have a nicer name? <laughs> it is, well, my particular program that I'm doing through the zoo and through the schools jointly mm -hmm. is called the Zoom Into Animals zoom, program. Zoom Into zoom Animals. Zoom Into Animals. Okay. And to zoom into this millipede a minute, um, they're amazing creatures. This is an extraordinarily large 
um, one. There are many that are much smaller, and they have different markings, different kinds of millipedes. And this one feels around with his antenna a lot because he doesn't actually see that well. So he's kind of tapping the ground to find his way along, or tapping my hand, actually. And they're different than the centipedes in that they have two legs per body section, and that's how you can tell the difference from centipedes. Um, they also have a neat defense system, just like the cockroaches and their hisses. These guys can curl up into a tight ball if they're afraid, or they can release a bit of cyanide poisoning out through little vents in the side mm -hmm. of their body, which will taste pretty badly to most birds or other animals that try to eat them. And a lot of those other animals, birds, will learn after trying to eat them once that it's not a good idea <laughs> and leave the next one alone. So they're great, great decomposers, and I'm going to let him go back into <laughs> his soil. Oh, you can see one last thing. We, we have to work very hard at the zoo at feeding animals the food that they really can deal with <laughs> that feels good to them. Mm -hmm. And we do put in carrots and zucchini pieces and other vegetable matter to give it a substitute for decaying plant matter, et cetera. So it's hard to take her or him off. I'm not sure, actually, in this case, of his or, his or her sex, because they really suck on you. <laughs> <laughs> and the other animal I want to show you, so nice and easy to carry these insects around because they're so little. Um, this is a walking stick. And walking sticks are amazing because of their ability to blend in with their environments. As you can see, looking at this one, um, if it was on a twig or a tree, which is where they usually stay, it would pretty much blend in with the bark and or the leaves. They tend to get darker as they get older, and they tend to be greener when they're younger. And you can see this walking stick, it almost looks like it's dancing. It's actually a very graceful um, small insect there. They have little um, kind of spurs that come along all the way up along the edge of their back. And that's to also simulate the kind of burrs that would grow on a tree twig. And sometimes they even have um, their eggs are laid to look like seeds so that it's another form of camouflage to protect their babies. Hmm. And they, like the cockroaches, have some very amazing mating strategies, too. One thing that differentiates the male from the female is the tail. This is the last thing I'm going to say about them today because we have a lot of other subjects. But I'm going to show you the skeleton, the outside skeleton of a dead um, walking stick, the female version, has a very pointed, narrow tail through which she can lay the eggs and even can point them into the ground. But usually they, they actually drop them from trees. So that's the difference. The male has a kind of flat tail back. <laughs> and I think it, we try not to anthropomorphize, but I do think he is waving goodbye <laughs> to you all. So. Well, we do have, uh, you've certainly whet our appetites here for seeing more fascinating animals. He doesn't want to seem to <laughs> say goodnight. Um, maybe we'll, we'll, we're going to be seeing a tape in just a moment, and that tape is going to be uh, showing us um, more things about the zoo. And then um, for people who are interested in visiting the zoo, we'll come back and talk about um, how they can visit the zoo, and we'll give them some numbers. They can um, get visitor information, mm -hmm. how to get to the zoo, and also if you're in interested in finding out more about the um, outreach and educational programs that you mentioned, both on site and um, going out into the community, um, we can um, give them those numbers as well. And I'm looking forward. So if the tape is ready, let's cue that tape. Let's go. Springtime is usually the baby season around here. Most of these animals breed seasonally, or as they breed in the fall and then they give birth in the spring. And uh, just by being a visitor, and uh, you know, we, we try to have a posting down at the ticket booth areas. So when the visitors do come in, there'll be a sign to show if we've had any recent births, and that'll direct them up to the hooves and horns area and, and tell them exactly which exhibit we've had a birth in. A lot of times they'll miss the babies. 
uh, because a lot of times the youngsters, uh, some of the different species that we have are called hider species. And, and that is that the youngsters will hide and remain hidden all day and the mother goes to them to nurse them. It's an adaptation that they have in the wild so that the predators, you know, don't find the youngsters and, and have them for dinner. We've got um, some wallabies, which are uh, marsupials. People know they're very similar to kangaroos. They're a smaller cousin of the kangaroos. And uh, right now we've got a couple that haven't showed their heads yet, but probably in another couple of months, come spring, we'll have a couple more youngsters for the people to see. And, uh, well, the, um, once the parents breed, uh, the youngster develops for about 28 days. And uh, then it travels, uh, is actually born, and travels into the mother's pouch where it adheres to a nipple, and it stays there for as long as five to six months and develops fully. And uh, then it probably would start showing its head around five months, six months. So How long will stay sort of half and half out? Um, the youngsters that we had from this previous year actually kept showing their heads and a little bit more, so they'd show a foot maybe a tail, you know, and every once in a while they'd fall out of the pouch and then hop back in. And they'd do that for a good four to six weeks, and then finally they were out of the pouch. But whenever they got afraid or, you know, nervous or startled by something, they'd immediately hop back in mom's pouch for safety. It'll actually come out in the springtime, fully developed and furry and, and looking like a little miniature wallaby. If we were to look in the mother's pouch now, which we, we don't make a practice of, um, you would see this tiny, small, hairless thing it kind of looks like a small chihuahua. Yeah. It, you know, it's got all the little hands and the tail and all, but it uh, doesn't quite look like a wallaby yet. We try to uh, maintain natural social groupings. Um, rather than just exhibit a single animal by itself or a pair, we try to have a, a complete family group. Or an animal that's normally found in a herd situation in the wild, we'll also try to duplicate that here in captivity. You know, we'll have a, a male and a female and their offspring or unrelated animals with them to try to keep the, the group situation which is it's more normal for the animals and uh, they'll act a lot more normal and you know youngsters will play together a lot of times the the parents and offspring will groom each other uh, frequently you get to see the the youngsters nursing from the mothers uh, sometimes the younger male animals uh, if they have horns they'll be sparring and sort of you know playing together chasing each other uh, a lot of times people will come during uh, you know the height of the afternoon when it's very very warm in the summertime is usually a napping time for the animals so I think a lot of times to encourage people to really get a greater appreciation of the animals would be to, to get them here earlier in the morning. Or a lot of times people think, you know, it's cold out, we send the animals out. Um, they are here year round. And uh, it's, it's really interesting and sometimes, you know, fun to watch that after a fresh snowfall, a lot of the animals will run right out and roll around in it. They seem to enjoy being in it. And uh, it, it's kind of neat for, the, for the, the public to come see a zebra who's normally found in Africa you know, having adapted to this cold weather. Uh, they do have the heated stall. However, not just so much going into a heated area, but the animals themselves have adapted. If you look real, real carefully, they, they get a longer coat in the, in the wintertime. Their hair actually get thicker and longer. It's really interesting if you, if you have a membership, you know, to, to come here frequently and to actually watch the animals grow up and go through their different changes and everything. Just to be able to walk through and, and see the animals up close, um, and also to, to smell the different areas, uh, it, it kind of brings a, a sense of, uh, you know, not so much a closeness, but a realization of, of other things. Whereas you could sit in your living room and watch it on TV, but you just don't get that same feeling. Uh, it's, I think it's a, it's a wonderful place. It's a gold mine. We're just waiting to happen. Hi, we're back. That was a lot of fun. Well, there's obviously a lot to look forward to this spring. Um, we're going to try to get those people to come out and visit the zoo. Visitors are important, and it's going to be a lot for them to see there. Babies bursting everywhere, <laughs> yeah? So um, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, some upcoming events, things to look forward to at the um, Franklin Park Zoo, mm -hmm. and also perhaps um, maybe any new acquisitions that you have mm -hmm. up your sleeves? Mm -hmm. Well, aside from babies, um, we have some very exciting things going on. Spring is definitely a rebirth at the zoo, not just for animals, but for all kinds of programs. The winter makes it difficult sometimes for us to do outdoor programs, but the first thing we have coming up uh, during school vacation week in April is our um, ninth annual um, Animal Olympics which is a wonderful time for school children to come to the zoo 
uh, kids of any age, really, we've even had adults take part in this, where they compete with animal records. For instance, um, we have a coyote run, and the kids are timed as they run from one spot to another for a total of five seconds to see if they can run in five seconds how far a coyote can run in five seconds. Mm. Of course, a coyote can run 293 feet in five seconds, and we haven't met a child yet who can run that fast, but it's fun to try to compete. We also have a turtle obstacle course, and the kids wear turtle shells on their backs made out of cartons that are painted, and they crawl through an obstacle course and try to keep their shells on their backs as they do it. So we have a lot of fun that day. And then we have a really exciting thing coming up on the 17th of April. Um, we have the warthogs coming. And uh, I don't know how many of you know what warthogs are, but they're these incredible uh, pig-like creatures from Africa. And they're going to be in our African tropical forest. They're very unusual looking. And uh, actually, I even have a picture. Um, because I'm not sure how many people have ever seen them before. This is a, um, a picture from uh, International Wildlife. But I don't know if you can focus in on that. But it shows a mother warthog and some baby warthogs. I don't know if you can zoom on that or not. But they are very unusual looking. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately, we don't have babies yet, but we're hoping to because we're getting a male and a female. Uh, and we're really excited about this. They're very active, interesting animals. And that's April 17th? April 17th will be the um, public opening for the warthog exhibit at the African Tropical Forest. And then on May 1st, we have our uh, ninth annual Fleece Festival Farm Day. And that's going to be a really exciting time. We invite everyone to come. We're going to have, we share our sheep that day. And uh, we also um, have hay rides. We're going to have mu live music. We're going to have um, ice cream to give away. We're going to have all kinds of concessions to sell. And it's a really fun time for people. Fantastic. Yes. That sounds wonderful. Yes. That's really good. Maya? You wanted to know about babies. Babies. And, and anything um, else? <laughs> I think there'll be a lot of children, human babies, young ones at the zoo, we hope. Um, there are some, there are more births in the spring of, of the animal world. However, uh, there are births all year long. I mean, we've had, maybe you want to talk about some of the different births we've had. We've had a lot of Adox antelope born, and they're um, part of a species that is nearly extinct in the wild. Uh, earlier in the program, Lisa Heche, the assistant curator at Hosen Horns, mentioned that that we have them. They're very beautiful. And we've been having, um, my mind is going blank. The wallabies. Yeah, the wallabies. We, we wallabies. have uh, possibly one baby wallaby in the pouch now that hasn't quite matured enough to pop its, its head out. But uh, last year, we had several wallaby births. Wallabies, for those people who don't know, are uh, related to the kangaroo family. And they are marsupials. And the babies have to crawl from the mother's vaginal area all the way up to a pouch on her abdomen where they go inside and latch onto a nipple and they stay there for months well, until they're ready. Well, we have some good information and mm -hmm. some exciting things. Maybe we can lure the people out to see the wallabies. Right now we're going to give you the phone number for the zoo so you can contact to get visitor information. And if you want to volunteer, there's also an, um, an extension. You can, after you call that number, you can get volunteer information, traveler's information, and additional outreach and educational information. I want to thank both my guests, Paula Silver and Maya Apfelbaum. Um, good night from Dead Air Live. And thank you very much for joining us tonight.